Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This week, Real Foot Forward is brought to you by Core10, a software company geared to solve the financial industry's most critical technology challenges at the fraction of the typical cost. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? One thing I discovered was our 1914 case steam engine is the heaviest farm tool in Discovery Park's collection weighing in at 22,000 pounds. I mean, I, I gotta think that that is the heaviest, the heaviest of most, can you think of an artifact other than maybe the Titan missile, maybe a few, maybe one of the airplanes, that's, that's pretty heavy. That might be at least in the top three of our heaviest artifacts. Yeah, I would say so. We'd have to ask Jennifer and see what she says. And it's right next to a brand new. Yes. I wonder how much that one weighs. We'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, you can let us know next time. So our very special guest today is from Dyersburg State Community College. She's one of the very first people that I uh, met with when I first returned to West Tennessee. Please welcome President of Dyersburg State, Dr. Karen Bowyer. Welcome. Well, thank you, Scott. It is great to be here with you today. So you have uh, th- th- you've been there for uh, quite a number of years, correct? That's correct. I mean, they fly by. It's thirty-seven, so it's hard to believe. Thirty-seven years. Yeah. That's um, absolutely incredible. We're going to get into a little bit of that in a minute. But first of all, I want to back all the way up. To I want to know where you came from and um, what mm-hmm. got you into the education field to begin with. Yeah, I, I grew up in Western Illinois in a region very similar to West Tennessee, a very rural area. I grew up on a farm um, and was, um, I guess I had a couple of aunts who were teachers and uh, and my mother was a Sunday school teacher. She wasn't a, you know, a, a school teacher as such, but anyway, um, just always. And of course, back in, I grew up in the 40s and 50s and, you know, opportunities for women then. You could be a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. It seemed like there weren't a lot of doors open at the time. Um, So I I got into teaching um, high school level first, uh, north of Chicago, in Libertyville, Illinois. And from there, uh, you know, I happened to come along at the time of Sputnik. You know, it went up in 19... uh, 57, and that really turned the world upside down as far as, especially the U.S., you know, and our uh, emphasis on science and mathematics. So I got into, I love mathematics, got into it, that, and uh, got a National Science Foundation uh, scholarship to go to Rutgers, get a master's in, at Rutgers in New Jersey. And then uh, from there, I went to South America and taught in an American uh, school, international school in Cali, Columbia, spent three years there. And then uh, finished a doctorate at University of Alabama because I they were teaching teachers in uh, Columbia. They would send people down to be sure we all stayed up to date and all. And then I went to Mexico City and taught for a year. And then I got married and moved to Memphis, Tennessee. And I've been in Tennessee since 72, so a long time. <laughs> now, now, where did you meet your husband? I had met him in Cali, Columbia. He was one of my professors, but I had finished my course before I started, uh, you know, dating him, I guess. So I'd already gotten my A. <laughs> uh, and, and so what, what was the inspiration for you to continue, uh, continue getting your degrees and continue uh, pursuing higher education? Yeah, I think my, my mother was quite an influence. I guess our mother's always influence, uh, influences a lot, but uh, she never had a chance to um, go beyond high school. And really encouraged me. I had two. I have two brothers. One, an older brother, younger brother. So um, all of us were encouraged to, you know, to go to college. And uh, my brother was a national merit, uh, fi- you know, finalist. And so he, he, you know, they, we had all kinds of people sitting around our kitchen table back then in the fifties to try to recruit him. And and I kind of tagged along. I went to. We both went to Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, a small liberal arts college. Um, uh, so anyway, it um, 
I guess it was, and some of my aunts and uncles, even though they did it during the depression, they went to, uh, you know, they got degrees at universities or at least some college ed education. So uh, my parents did not, but um, so anyway, it, it was just kind of an expectation. You're going to go to college. You're only 20 in my high school uh, graduating class and probably, um, you know, only uh, pr probably less than 10 of us went to college. You know, it was rural area, lots of farming and everybody was their family farms. They were expected to take over. And so that's what happened to a lot of them, I think. But I bet you were among the few who went to a different country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to. Yeah, my at the time that I went to Colombia, my brother was in the Navy. Uh, he was in uh, Japan at the time. And, uh, you know, being in New Jersey, we were near New York City and <clears throat> spent a lot of time there. Um, and there was international school services uh, in New York at the time. Now I think it's uh, there at Princeton in New Jersey. But anyway, we several of us in my uh, class at Rutgers applied to teach um, overseas. And one of my friends went to uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And I had an offer in Japan and an offer in Colombia. And my brother in Japan said, well, you can't live on that salary over here. <laughs> so he probably just didn't want me in Japan. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I went to Colombia and had a wonderful time and really toured that whole uh, um, area. I mean, I saw every country in South America and Central America. And so we had a wonderful time exploring. And, you know, we were all in our 20s and. And it was a it was a time that the uh, Peace Corps came into Columbia too in the '60s. So there are a lot of Peace Corps around us and doing a lot of great things in agriculture and education and business development. So it was an exciting time. Now, when you landed in Memphis, I'm curious because <laughs> I'm from Memphis. What uh, neighborhood did you live in? Well, we uh, bought a home, and I still have it uh, in East Memphis near Walnut Grove and White Station in that area. Um, yeah. So near a lot of great schools like White Station, you know, Richland and uh, White Station Elementary. And, and then there are, you know, so, uh, quite a few private schools. So <clears throat> it's a really a thriving part of uh, Memphis, I think. Oh, yeah. Still. Yeah. Still yeah. So what what did you do when you for employment? When you were in Memphis. Yeah, I taught at the University of Memphis. My husband was, the reason we went there, he had gotten a job from, he had been a professor at University of Alabama in uh, educational philosophy and um, and all of that. So he became head of a department there and foundations of education with research. And, and I taught mathematics in the um, college there, or in the university, the College of Arts and Sciences. And and at the same time, the community college was just opening in um, Memphis, uh, Shelby State Community College it was the name at that time. And I applied and I became an adjunct uh, math teacher in January. The, I had filled a full-time position. Someone had just left at the university. And so I filled that during the fall and, and they were winning a statistician, which I was not. So anyway, I didn't get the full-time, I didn't apply for the full-time job and went to Shelby State as an, a part-time teacher. And uh, about 12 years later, I was interim president at Shelby State. So, you know, with a, a brand new institution and a lot of opportunity and I was, uh, you know, ready to try a lot of things. So uh, I never said no, probably to committee assignments and all those uh, sorts of opportunities and ended up uh, serving about 15 months there as interim. And then uh, uh, when the new president came in, I stayed a year or so and had the offer to come to Dyersburg in 1984. So I, I spent 12 years in Memphis and now 37 up here. So actually when the Board of Regents started, which is our governing board, was 1972 when I went to a faculty uh, reception for new faculty. My husband and I went and, uh, and Cecil Humphreys, Cecil C. Humphreys was the president of uh, Memphis State at the time. And he says, well, I've just been named the first chancellor of the Board of Regents and I'm going to Nashville. And that's when Billy Mac Jones, I think, came into Memphis State. And, <clears throat> and now, you know, Memphis State is University of Memphis sometime in the 90s. And Shelby State joined with State Tech at Memphis to become Southwest Tennessee Community College in the year, year 2000. So um, all of that's changed a bit, but still, 
a lot of my colleagues I work with, I still see on a regular basis um, in Memphis or around West Tennessee. So, I'm curious, you know, today there's a big emphasis on trying to get uh, young female students to develop an interest in some of the STEM um, areas, especially science and math, like you said. Were you uh, one of the few uh, women professors who were in mathematics at the time? Or yeah, tell you, me know, a bit about that. you know, at, um, at University of Memphis, yes. I don't think there was, maybe there was one other woman who was a math, uh, you know, instructor. At Shelby State, <clears throat> I was one of the first, you know, the person that hired me was uh, um, a man. But after that, um, I became the department head and uh, we hired a lot of K through 12 or really a lot of high school teachers that had their masters in mathematics. Uh, so I, I think, um, I, I think when I left that department, it was probably half men and half women. Um, so that was kind of how she, the early uh, days of community colleges. Now um, we have people who come out of graduate school and come directly to us to teach. But, you know, the community colleges really started in Tennessee in 1965. So when I got there in 72, they were very, very uh, young and, you know, a new kind of education. Well, you were definitely a trailblazer and are a trailblazer. I'm going to see if I say this right. You <clears throat> were the first female president in a public post-secondary institution and the first female and longest serving president in the Tennessee Board of Regents system. Did that's, I say that right? That's correct. And I probably, I don't know, there may be a, a president that served in a a private institution in Tennessee a little bit longer than me, but uh, and for sure in the public institutions, it's that's the case. <laughs> that's uh, that's quite an accomplishment. So congratulations on that. <clears throat> um, I'm curious what uh, you've been in that in the um, education system for a long time. Um, obviously, the changes that have happened in the last you know <clears throat> uh, 37 years in education <laughs> have been. Uh, significant. What are some of the things you've observed, some of the changes and evolutions in the education system? Well, the classroom sure looks different. And of course, the classrooms all over the country now or all over the world or even outer space. So uh, it's phenomenal, uh, the, the changes in technology. Um, you know, I entered a classroom with a piece of chalk and a textbook, and uh, you don't do that anymore. <laughs> There's not even a board to write on if you got a piece of chalk. Um, so it's uh, very, very high tech. And, and that's, um, you know, that's really difficult for a lot of our, I mean, our faculty, I think, have kind of grown up with it. And new people that we hire, we help them. There's an awful lot of, uh, you know, professional development available to help them get up to speed. But it's, uh, it's a brand new game. And we, uh, you know, we were fortunate at Dyersburg State, we had uh, Dr. John Moore, who was our uh, director at first and then became vice president of information technology. And he'd worked uh, with NASA on this, on the moonshot, actually. He was a, a math and uh, I think physics major and who had gotten, I mean, we all got into IT gradually as, you know, we were sorting uh, cards through machines when we were in college in the sixties and, and um, you know machine reading things but anyway he uh, he brought us along very quickly even though we were the smallest college in uh, public college in Tennessee uh, he was the go-to person for IT in the whole state at least in our system and tremendous um, leader and really helped this college uh, develop maybe more quickly than the others um do you feel like there are more opportunities uh, now for young girls that are learning science and math and through the education system? Have you seen a change in that area? I have. We have um, one of our faculty members, Shauna Adams, uh, a young woman who is teaching biology for us and head of our STEM project. And she has the faculty, of course, in science and math and, and all uh, working with her, but she's kind of a lead person. And we have a lot of uh, middle school and high school kids uh, that we work with. And I think we've worked with you on some of those science displays and projects. But uh, and we have a grant from the Battelle uh, group, you know, with Oak Ridge. And and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, exciting things really going on in STEM and high schools 
trying very hard to become STEM high schools. I know Peabody High School in Trenton just became one, and, and here at Dyer County High School, and I think the North Side, uh, you know, Norview Middle School, the different ones are are doing an awful lot of good work in science. So for, for our listeners who uh, maybe are not too familiar with uh, the education system, what is the difference between like a university and a community college and, and all the other things in between? I can never <laughs> keep it straight. Yeah. Well, you know, in a, and I've taught at both, you know, at all levels um, from, I guess I've taught even fourth graders at not, uh, you know, not year long, but briefly. Um and I've taught, you know, at Memphis State. So anyway, um, the, in the university, there's a big focus on research. Um, you know, faculty are really encouraged to uh, be involved in research and writing, um, you know, kind of promoted on the basis of how many uh, refereed journal articles they can get and, and that sort of thing. And in the community college, uh, we value that research, we learn from it, and we do research with our, you know, we try different teaching methods, but our focus is really on teaching. And we do require people to have graduate work, um, you know, at least a master's in their discipline, or if they have a master's of education, they have to have 18 graduate hours, or we encourage that in the discipline. So if I were to teach math, I would need at least 18 graduate semester hours in mathematics. And so uh, that that is the main difference. And plus, we're we teach uh, fairly small sections. We our average class size is about twenty. Um, when I was at University of Memphis, sometimes I had fifty in my uh, beginning math classes. Uh, across the hall, I was in the psychology building too with math and psychology, and they would have maybe two hundred in a lecture. So we, uh, we don't do that. Um, I would say across the country, uh, community colleges are, uh, have kind of a reputation for more personal attention and, and faculty get involved, you know, trying to help students who are um, just a lot more uh, personal one-on-one -on -one concern about the student. They're, they're not a number, that's for sure. In fact, we all try to learn students' names on the first day. And of course, with Zoom now, you see your names up there. That's, it's, uh, but uh, faculty uh, even use, uh, you know, like uh, place cards or um, name plates. You know, they pass them out and everybody puts their name and personalizes it and puts it up in front of them so that everybody can call everybody the, by their first name or however they want to be uh, addressed. So it's very different from um, teaching in a big university or even a small university. You know, UT Martin does a great job, but they have their, their you know, classes maybe a little bit larger than ours in a lot of cases. Sure. So you mentioned Zoom, um, obviously because of COVID, you know, it changed all the rules and slingshotted <laughs> us into this world of Zoom. Uh, were you, was your uh, professors and faculty using Zoom to teach during the pandemic? Definitely, but we had we had used it before um, before the whole you know March thirteenth, which was a dividing day for us, or a real uh, interesting day to say the least. But um, since we have three locations, three major locations, and we're in about ten or eleven, ten to twelve high schools every semester, and so we actually have Zoom classrooms set up at say Mumford High School, and we've had them set up at O'Brien County Central High School. Um, but we connect Trenton, the Gibson County Center with uh, Jimmy Nafee Center with Dyersburg often for classes. Um, you know, when you get into the upper level classes, sometimes there's only five or six, you know, say in Dyersburg at one, two or three in Trenton, and maybe five in, in Covington. And so they all link together and the faculty member tries to travel to the different locations uh, pretty frequently to see them face to face, but you know, they're face to face on Zoom anyway. And we use some of our HERF money, that Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund that we, we, we started receiving those funds in March or I guess April of 2020. So we've um, used that money over the years to set up some um, um, new Zoom rooms. So we have about 25 of them around our three locations. And I, I think that's counting maybe Mumford or maybe that's the 26th one. But we are um, we, we continue to I mean, we're using it some we're back. 
with about 70% of our classes are in person this semester. Uh, they may be a hybrid to some degree, you know, they may be in person one or two days a week and, and then a day remote, but um, it's, um, you know, and students have really responded positively to that. So it's been great. Well, and, and I've been to a lot of universities and, and colleges and community colleges even, um, and you guys have one thing, in addition to your award-winning facility and talented professors, uh, you also have uh, an incredible collection of taxidermy. Uh, can you describe that for our listeners who've never gotten to visit your campus and tell me how that came about and the story behind that? Yeah, you know, Crossroads, Tennessee did a special on that uh, a while back. So it's, it is kind of a, a unique feature. But um, yes, Dr. David was a, um, a big game hunter and Don Dills, who still lives in the area, Don lives in uh, Troy, I believe. Don was our you know, state legislator. So the two of them did a lot of hunting together in Africa and, and in Mexico and of course in this country. So we have an awful lot of trophies from, um, from Africa that uh, Dr. David brought back and, um, or I don't know exactly how all that was done. I know we do have a large polar bear and I have seen the old eight millimeter footage of that polar bear, as they say, being taken um, on a you know ice flow like there in Alaska and then a large grizzly bear and then other game um, from Africa and North America. And I think we have four sheep um, from from uh, Mexico and uh, they call the Grand Slam, I guess. He really went all five of them. And he, some, for some reason, the Mexican government wouldn't let them take out whatever the fifth sheep was. And uh, But um, back in about 1990, uh, Dr. David gave that collection to the college and Don Dills was able to help us get the funds through the legislature to kind of set up museum class um, showcases and, and we also have match pairs of uh, ducks that you know migrate up uh, the, along the Mississippi River and so that's quite a nice collection too uh, and so it's uh, we've got a lot of scout troops that go through a lot of uh, school groups and you know a lot of people will come through to see that and it's it's worth it and we just have been, um, and again, it's Shauna Adams that I mentioned with STEM, we've just been designated as a class one arboretum. And we're sitting here right beside uh, Okina Park in Dyersburg. And, and Okina Park is also a, uh, an arb a I, I don't know if it's class one, class two arboretum. So we've got at least two major attractions to come and take a look at on our campus in Dyersburg. Um, we're going to take a short break, and when we get back, I've got a couple more questions for you. Core 10 pairs seasoned technology architects in Nashville with ambitious developers in Huntington, West Virginia, and Martin, Tennessee, to deliver made-in-the-U.S. financial tech and digital banking solutions at a value. With Core 10, you have flexible, scalable access to the skill sets you need when you need them that set you up for success at a cost that keeps you competitive. For more info, visit core10.io. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. My special guest today is Dr. Karen Bowyer, president of Dyersburg State. Uh, the vast majority of us will never be uh, college or university presidents. What, so I'm curious, I certainly won't be. I'm curious, what is your day like? What is the typical day like for you? Oh, wow. Yeah, there's not many typical days, but, you know, I try to meet with my own direct reports on a at least monthly basis. So probably one, one or two meetings a day, maybe with them, um, usually events like uh, Former Representative Bill Sanderson's coming in here uh, in a few minutes, uh, and he's actually going to make a gift to the college. And uh, so we sometimes we have donors stop by like that and uh, want to, um, you know, kind of maybe take a little tour around, see what's going on. Um, last week, we had visitors from the Board of Regents and 
spend an hour or two with them talking about how we're doing with recruiting students. And, you know, this fall in Dyersburg State was the uh, fastest growing or we grew by the greatest percentage. We had a 7.1% um, uh, increase in our full-time equivalent enrollment and uh, headcount, of course, went up too. And our, I think the average for the system was down about 10%. So, Again, we, we've been here in person and we're pretty aggressive about working with our students and it really paid off. Um, and then trying to do it in person, I think was attractive to a lot of students. So that's, um, um, you know, it's, it seems like it's a quite a varied, <laughs> a varied schedule, which I love, you know, I mean, I was in the classroom and you knew every day kind of what you're gonna do. Uh, and sometimes as a president, it's a little less predictable. And then there's just a lot of time to plan and try to think about, uh, you know, what should we be doing next? And and we're working with a lot of initiatives. And I, I get involved in grant writing. We we are uh, we raise the most money of all the community colleges in Tennessee. And a lot of it's from grants, but a lot from donors, too. So last year, I think uh, we have to report through this voluntary support of education and uh, it was about $2.2 million and probably, um, you know, 1.4 or seven of, so of that was at least from grants. And maybe we raise eight, seven to 800,000, at least from donors every year. And then we're trying to build an endowment. And that's, so uh, I started that in 88 with zero and we're at about $12 million there. So, um, so every year we we have an annual fund, and I think over these 37 years we've raised uh, about 34, 35 million dollars, and that's kind of money in and money out every year to uh, help with scholarships and programs and whatever the donor tells us they want to do. So anyway, there's a lot of um, friend raising and uh, you know just um, working with people that may help the college and, and then responding to needs. Or I go to, we're a member of every chamber in the area. And so we try to attend their morning coffees or their evening, uh, you know, networking times or go to their golf tournaments or whatever, you know. So there's just, I know last week we were at a, um, a banquet, uh, annual banquet over in Humboldt for that chamber a week or so ago. And um <clears throat> And then um, there's always time, there seems like there are presentations. I'll be working with West Star next week, I guess. And they want kind of a presentation on the college and what's going on. So putting all that together. So I think in small colleges, you know, some presidents have speech writers and people that do all these things, but small colleges, we all get to do a lot and it's, you know, makes the job interesting, but it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty intense most of the time. You alluded to it a little, but I'm curious, what do you think is the impact to the community from having a college uh, there in town? How is Dyersburg different? Yeah. We, uh, you know, if you look, at, there's county reports, a profile uh, uh, on education that the Tennessee Higher Education puts out on every county in Tennessee. And our county has a higher percent of associate degree graduates and you know, because we're here, um, the hospital here has no problem staffing, you know, with registered nurses because we supply them and we, we grow our own. And probably half of the teachers in this area have come here for something. They may have gotten an associate and gone on to Martin or University of Memphis or Union or somewhere to get their um, bachelor's degree. But uh, we get a lot of people started who would never have thought about going to college, um, could not have left town, maybe money, maybe uh, family responsibilities, whatever. 33% of our students are um, over 20 or 25 or older. So these are people that probably are working pretty full time and maybe going online or coming here in the evening or whenever, you know, to uh, get their education. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, uh, we had a woman graduate in, uh, as a registered nurse. Uh, she was 66 years old. So, you know, people of all ages come back here. Um, maybe they finally <laughs> reared their family and have time or whatever. And, and the scholarships we've been able to offer in Tennessee through the lottery have opened the doors for 
when we first opened with Tennessee Promise in 2015, I had families come in and said, we never thought we could afford an education for our, our, our son or daughter. And finally we can. And, you know, it pays tuition, but there's still a lot of other costs with transportation, with books and materials. So um, that's why we keep raising money to help students. And plus there's a little, um, path you got to follow to get your Tennessee promise and some students don't have any help and they miss deadlines and and then they're out they can't um, they can't receive that money and and so the, those are students we try to help too so it's in it's in our best interest in this community to get get everyone coming out of high school with a post-secondary credential and you know transportation is a big item in northwest Tennessee for people to get here and even broadband you know to get to us on the internet or to have all that capability often that doesn't work either so now we're trying to do a whole lot more in high school so we are offering a certified nursing assistant credential to students and we have about 55 of them registered among seven high schools in West Tennessee this fall. So we're trying to, uh, and we're gonna be offering EMT training as soon as we can get that approved by the state in high school. So high school seniors can become emergency medical technicians in their senior year of high school. So, so for, for someone who's driving along right now, listening to us while they're either on their way to or on their way from, or even doing a job that they don't necessarily feel like they're reaching their uh, full potential, what are some of the air, other areas you've mentioned uh, health care? What are some of the other areas they might could come to Dyersburg State um, and get a career in after they graduate? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities in information technology. Uh, in manufacturing, all of our companies are wanting, you know, robotics technicians. They want uh, programmable logic controlling uh, controllers who understand all of uh, working with those, that kind of equipment. So we offer all of that to them, um, you know, and EMTs, as I mentioned, it's healthcare, but a little bit different uh, or paramedic, uh, that kind of um, opportunity. We have child, a lot of work in child care. In fact, we're working with the Promethean uh, group and, um, you know, some of our students are, I mean, some of, yeah, some of our students are their employees are trying to get them through more credentials to be uh, even better employees. And then education is a huge need in this area. And then business, you know, there's um, all kinds of business courses. It's, it's really a big area for us. So um, many, many opportunities. And, you know, if you're in IT, you might want to be a hands-on networking kind of, or, you know, with networking, or you might want to be software development or even game development. We don't have a course on how you, you know, get into gaming. But if you understand all the programming languages, that's the basis of that. And, and so we're someone's driving along right now and they're listening. What, what do they do? Who's the person they should talk to to explore the potential? Yeah, there's a, we have what we call one stops and there's phone numbers out there for our one stops. Uh, wouldn't you know, I wouldn't have it right here in front of me, but uh, um that there's a one stop in Dyersburg in our student center. There's a one stop in Trenton, you know, the Gibson County Center just inside the door. There's a one stop in the Jimmy Nafee building, which is the first building we built in Covington at the Jimmy Nafee Center. So, you know, just stopping in if they wanted to do that, if they just call, um, you know, our number here, uh, 286-3300, that's the president's office, we would transfer them to uh, one stop or if they want to leave a message for us we'd be happy to pick up and and get them to whoever they're interested in one other area that we're developing is logistics and that's a huge area for this area i mean it's with fedex in memphis with our class um, uh, you know high what is it class five uh, the railroad classes we have in in memphis i know plus of course going right through our area here the canadian national and then the river opportunities. Uh, I mean, we're just sitting in the catbird seat really for, for logistics and, and being in the middle of the country. So that's a lot of IT work plus other kinds of work to um, uh, become a good. And then University of Memphis has a center of excellence in logistics. So if you wanted to go on in a, with a master's or a bachelor's, master's, all of that, you could. 
But here in Dyersburg, we have Dot Foods that needs help. Uh, there's a lot of logistics going on with Ermco moving all those transformers all over the country. Um, and of course, Tyson and uh, on and on, there's a need. And now with the Blue Oval City coming to the mega site, we are all gearing up to do more with, well, I mean, they're going to need such a range of things. They're going to be suppliers in all of our communities. So uh, there's no end to uh, opportunities if you can get a credential and certificates or associate degrees or bachelors are all valuable. Um, but, you know, we can get you started with a, a certificate even that will mean a lot in terms of earning power. Well, and we'll put a link in the show notes to where they can go to find those locations that you mentioned. Okay. Um, I'm curious, uh, as we close, what are some of things that inspire you? What, what has been your biggest inspiration and what's been the thing that's propelled you to uh, do all the things that you've done for the community? Yeah, we just had some reports Friday from uh, our Board of Regents and how, how, how well Dyersburg State had done compared to others in improving graduation rates, improving uh, retention rates, and all the things, student success that we've been working on. So I guess the big challenge for me over the last uh, few years is just to mobilize uh, our team and trying to get them to focus on uh, some really critical uh, indicators of success for our students. And we've spent an awful lot of money in the last two or three years on faculty development. You know, the faculty member is the one that's there with our students the most. You know, we do have uh, counselors and advisors, people that, you know, are in their lives too, but not like the faculty member is. So helping faculty to be better prepared, not that they're not good faculty, they were great to begin with, but they really have picked up or maybe some of the things they're doing that's been reinforced that they are really research-based and, and very successful techniques to use. So it seems like we've really focused in on that and we have made a difference and uh, moved, um, you know, more than a lot of other institutions have. So it's, that's, um, you know, just and trying to figure out what, there's no silver bullet for any of our problems, but, uh, you know, trying to figure out the combination of things that might really make a difference. And now what's next for you personally? <laughs> well, you know, I, I enjoy traveling. Like I talked about Colombia and Mexico and South America and all that. I think I've been in about 80 countries around the world. And uh, my husband and I did a lot of uh, educational, went to a lot of educational meetings, like in Africa and Asia and Europe and, um, South America. So I'm, uh, I haven't seen them all yet. So I'd love to do a little more traveling. And we've had international programs here at Dyersburg State. So there are friends that I have in France and Germany through those programs that I'd like to uh, visit. Um, and just having a little more time. And I have a, a cabin in Colorado that I enjoy and getting out there. And I've just spent some time with some family in Illinois and I don't get up there enough. And I have family in Virginia and Colorado too. So anyway, just time to do some of those things. And, uh, you know, life is uh, sh sh much too short, <laughs> even though you do. Uh, I've enjoyed a lot of good years, but uh, hopefully be able to enjoy some more and, uh, you know, maybe do some volunteer work in Memphis. And I may, uh, continue on some projects here at the college um, with my service. I'm, you know, I've, I think we'll be president emeritus, but you know, the board has to decide that for sure. And if that's the case, then the new president would um, be able to ask me to help with some projects or, you know, some things that they might want to get done. So. And for those who don't know, you recently announced your retirement. How much longer uh, will you be there? I, I think it's about 10 more weeks. I, uh, I'm going to retire on New Year's Eve, so somewhere around midnight. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's incredible. And uh, you've done amazing work for West Tennessee, and I know that's going to continue. And I'm so glad that I, I kept I had you on my list to, to talk uh, for so long. So I'm so glad we, we finally connected and made it happen. Well, I am too. So thank you very much, Scott. And of course, I'll be visiting Discovery Park more. I have not... Uh, I've not explored every nook and cranny of that uh, wonderful facility, and, and I know it keeps changing, so I'll be up to see you. <laughs> That's very good. All right. uh, we, really, we really appreciate it. 
Um, and as you're traveling around, and I'm sure you'll tell folks about Dyersburg, you can also tell them about Discovery Park. I there. will. I will. And, you know, visitors coming in, I'll be sure they see it. So, okay. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Thanks to all of you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Mm-hmm.